Hi to YouTube. I'm gonna be another, uh, gonna be doing another reading here, and, uh, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna do the accent. I don't know, maybe I'll do an accent with some other thing. Who knows? Okay, so I'm gonna be reading some more chapters, starting with chapter 14. Kinda late again, so I'm not quite sure as to how long I'll go. Maybe I'll be able to do the whole section, but... At the very least, you'll get 14, more likely than not 15, and possibly 16. How about that? Sounds like a deal. Alright, so I suppose I'll start reading now. Chapter 14 The hot sun beat down on Trello Bridge, reflecting off the cursing waters of the Grumar River. Celerity blinked away a drop of sweat and blew a strand of hair out of her face. Her, ar her army had made good time. It had been four days since the council where everything fell apart. She traveled as fast as she could with her entourage and had arrived at Trello yesterday to find her forces already arrayed at the bridge. Close to 3,000 of Whitetail's finest troops stood ready to face the coming griffins. Come on. Get comfortable. Celerity sur um, surveyed the war camp. Fires and tents had sprung up on the north side of the river like bushes on a shrubland. Her own tent rested on a hill at the rear of the camp, where she planned her strategy for the coming battle. The bells were famed for two things, their impeccable taste and their unmatched experience in war. Hmm, interesting. It was they who had led the final sieges of the Great War, 600 years before, and it was Abel, Lord Elusive Clement, Solari's distant ancestor, who had led the final charge against the Griffin Lions at the old Griffin capital in the Everfree Forest. While Princess Luna had claimed the city as her own and rebuilt it as Lunaria, the Moon City, she had seen fit to grant the bells with the wide sweeps of land that um, of land that constituted the Duchy of Whitetail. As Celerity was determined to keep it, neither Griffins nor her enemies to the north would ta um, would take one ace more of her country acre more more of her country. Duh. <laughs> anyway, they were going to smash the invaders to pieces at the bridge. The battle would soon um, would come soon. She was sure of it, but she needed more time. The troops pledged by Weatherforge had arrived yesterday, a generous commitment of several of 700 pegasi. They were, um, they were normally assigned to manage weather throughout the southern provinces, but they had been called together and hastily armed for battle. She would need their help to hold the air against the Griffin Flyers. Everything depended on keeping them locked on the south side of the river. Westernman had not yet arrived. Her scouts reported his troops were on the move and would reach Trello by evening tomorrow. Even so, she wasn't sure that um, there would be enough um, ponies to hold the bridge for long against a horde so vast. She frowned. They didn't have a choice. If they lost here, all of Equestria would fall to the Griffins. Something glinted off in the distance. Celerity squinted, trying to get a closer look at whatever the object was. It was high in the air, rapidly approaching her camp. As it neared, the shine of light was joined by a multitude of other glares. Celerity felt her he heart lift. Could it be? Had the princess really... No. Surely not. Shouts for the camp below told her the troops had noticed it too. Soon the sky was filled with armored, um, golden armored pegasi bearing the standard of the sun. They circled the camp once, speeding through the air. The troops below cheered and clop clopped their hooves, their spears uplifted by the display of precision flying. The pegasi looped and intertwined through the air, finally completing the circle and coming in for a landing. The sky blue Pegasus, her armor sparkling like the clear waters of the Grumar, glinted, um, glinted down in front of Celerity. As the rest of the Pegasi touched the ground, she removed her helmet to reveal a head of um, full of shock white hair. She gave a brief salute, which Celerity returned. Captain Windstreak Strudel of the Firewings, reporting for duty, Duchess Bell. She looked behind at the rest of the Firewings. Sorry about the showing off. My lieutenant figured your boys could use a show to get um, use a show to get morale up. Celerity's face broke into a grin. Thank him for me. So, Celestia has finally seen reason? We have her support against the Griffins? I'm afraid not, said Winstreak. We're here on our own. The princess wasn't happy, but we have to do what's best for Equestria. Celerity's jaw hung open. Boggled, she said. You deserted? You've gone rogue? All 312 of us, ma'am. We're at your service. The Duchess processed this for a moment, an uncontrollable cheer springing up inside her. Excellent! 
This might just be the edge we need to win this battle. I'm assigning the Firewing to oversee the Cloudsdale Division from Weatherforge. Come, we need to work out a new battle plan. Please, follow me. The two commanders entered Celerity's tent as the Firewings met with the Whitetail Ponies and began setting up their camps. Inside the tent, Celerity had arrayed several maps showing the positions of troops. I expect the Griffins will be here within the week. Hopefully, Westerman's troops will have reached us by then. If not, we'll be hard-pressed to hold the line. So what is your plan, Duchess? The Griffins will um, come from the south, Celerity pointed. They need to capture the bridge to move their infantry north. Their only other option is marching all the way to the west and fording the river in Breton. That would be a stretch. That, um, that would stretch their lines out to a ridiculous size. They'd never be able to maintain that kind of commitment. If they want to cross the river, they're going to have to um, have Trello, and that's what and that's where we'll break them. Why not simply destroy the bridge? I considered it. However, if we force the Griffins to find another route, they might decide it faster to simply ditch their armor and fly the entire army over. That may be hundreds of thousands of them would be more than enough to defeat our army in a full-on fight. But as long as Shrikefeather sees the opportunity to move their heavy siege and ground forces, he'll try to take the bridge. It's the perfect trap. She moves to the side of the table. We'll hold a line of spear points on the bridge. It's a wide structure, to be sure. But it'll... Ugh, hold on. <sighs> hold on, I'm messing around here for someone. Uh, to be sure... It will only um, fit 60 ponies across at maximum. Their advantage in numbers will be completely nullified. We can hold the bridge as long as it takes for them to realize the effort is futile and retreat to plan their next attack. And if we can stall their advance for a week, then I should be receiving reinforcements and new weapon shipments. Weapon shipments? From whom? Winstreak had a sh sinking feeling she knew, but the Duchess shook her head. It's of no concern right now. We simply need to hold the bridge for a week. Just one week. Then, with reinforcements from Bren and Rivermeat, we can push them back into the desert. Windstreak acquiesced, nodding. The greatest danger I can see in your plan is the Griffin's air forces. The majority of, the, um, the majority of them serve as infantry, but what do their flying units get behind us? Once they break that wall, the battle will be lost. That's where you come in. The Duchess snagged a quill in her mouth, quickly satching an axe on the map. You'll be stationed in the air here. The Firewings and the Cloudsdale Pegasi have the most important job in this fight. I need you to keep the skies clear of Griffin attack wings. Winstrick nodded. We can do that. The Duchess's smile was predatory. Then we will win. The Griffins will not take that bridge. General Shrikefeather stood atop a small um a small hill and only raced um the only race terrain between here and the river. The vast army of Griffa marched before him, completely obscuring the sight on the ground from sight. His scouts reported the ponies massing on the other side of the water. They responded quicker than he expected. It looked like there was going to be a battle for trouble after all. The bridge would pose an interesting problem, but after nearly a hundred years of leading the armies of Griffa, he would not be stopped by a simple choke point. Lieutenant? Yes, General? Are the attack wings ready? As you ordered, sir. They're prepared to fly today, if you wish. Excellent. We need to hit them before their reinforcements arrive from the north. Tell them to begin the raid. Hit and run only. I don't want any open conflict yet. We'll weaken them before they strike. Before we strike. Target their scouts. Harass their air defenses. Yes, sir. What about the siege weaponry? Still en route from Griffa. They're having some trouble getting it through the scr um, shrub scrublands. The recent storm turned the ground to mud and the trepicates are getting stuck. Tell them to hurry it up. We'll need to crack open the capital. The general scratched a claw along the ground, running numbers in his head. What news on our backup plan? They're on the way, perhaps three days' journey from here. They should have been here yesterday. What's taking so long? The lieutenant shifted uneasily. If you'll remember, sir, you felt that stealth would be preferable to speed. Yes, yes, I know, said the general. No matter. That's a last resort anyways. If all goes as planned, we'll crack the ponies by the end of the week, and from there, we'll begin moving north. He looked at the lieutenant. By this time, seven days from now, you and I will be sharing a drink in Cloudsdale. Looking forward to it, sir. The griffin bow um, bowed and flew off. The general returned to watching his army march. The campaign was about to begin in earnest. 
<sighs> all right, chapter 15. Yeah, uh, I think I'll be able to make all three chapters. Chapter 15. I think it's time we stop for the night. Cranberry was exhausted. She felt as though they'd been walking for days. Beside her, Inger looked equally weary. There was something about this forest that drained, um, just drained her to the bone. She felt drowsy, like she'd had too much wine. Rye, on the other hand, seemed more hyperactive than she'd seen him in years. He was practically radiating energy. Literally, in fact. His horn was too bright to look directly at now. Sounds good to me, he chirped, spinning around like a filly chasing her tail. Cranberry and Inger collapsed, too tired to even bother with, um, bother with the tent. She was snoring in seconds. Inger tried valiantly to stay awake. I should take the first watch. Rai shook his head empathetically. Don't worry about it. I'll do it tonight. He grinned. You need your beauty rest, Inger. The Pegasus eye, um, eyelids drooped shut on the, of their own accord, and he was too soon out cold. Rai pranced around them both, letting his horn's light extinguish. He felt so... alive. This force was the most wonderful place he'd ever been. Uh, yeah. He felt like he could go for days without see, um, sleep. The magic bubbled up and over him like a refreshing bath. It was wonderful. He looked at his sleeping companions, and a mischievous grin lit his face. Oh gosh, is he gonna draw on them faces? Anyway, there was nothing around in this forest. They hadn't seen another living thing all day. His two companions would be perfectly safe. He dropped his saddlebags um, and removed his cloak, setting them in a pile. He trotted off into the trees to play around with some more of his powerful, his wonderful new power. Hours passed as the trees lit with the colors of magic. Spells flew haphazardly around as Rai let his imagination run wild. All he had to do was visualize the spell and channel the power through his horn, and it became reality. He lifted rocks and bushes, throwing them to the winds. Trails of fire danced through the air, intertwining with each other and moving as he willed. It was exhilarating. He started trying bigger things. He pictured a tree bursting into flames, and with a hot rush, the magic poured through him and set it ablaze. With another thought, he snuffed out the fire. It vanished with a gratifying pop. This force was amazing. The magic had, be had, um, had to be some natural phenomenon, some unexplained miracle that promised him everything. It was all around him, seething in the air like a sweltering heat, bringing bliss whenever he touched it. Rai felt as though he could fly. He paused, taken by the idea. He spread his tiny wings, looking at them. Really looking at them, for the first time in a long while. They were too short, too wispy. The feathers rugged and tattered. He flapped them experimentally. What's it like, Mom? It's the best feeling in the world, Rai. The open sky, the plains spreading out beneath your hooves, the mountains in the distance peering over the horizon. You'll see it someday, Rai. I promise. His crippled body would never be able to leave the ground. But then, he thought the same about magic. Painful memories edged his consciousness. The wild power pulsed in his head. Perhaps... Oh, Rai, how could you? You could have been killed. Dad, I didn't get hurt. Your father and I expected better of you, Rai. I just wanted to... If I ever catch you on the bakery roof again, I swear I'll lock you in the house for a week. Don't scare me like that. I just wanted to... To fly... Closing his eyes, Rai reached deep into the flow. The magic was still hot, but by now it felt like the welcoming heat of walking into a warm house in the middle of winter. His fire burned within him, filling him with energy. He felt the tingling in his wingtips. Rai looked up towards the trees. He crouched and leapt into the air. Rai, what are you doing up here? It's getting dark. Go away, Cranberry. You shouldn't be out on the mountain by yourself. The stairs to the castle get pretty slippery in the winter. I'm fine. Go away. Right. I don't know what's gone into you lately, but it's dangerous up here. Come on, let's go back to town. No, I'm fine right here. He fell to the ground. Again. He jumped up, trying to imagine, picture himself soaring through the sky. He touched the ground once more. Rai furrowed his brows, concentrating harder than he had ever before. This was his chance to fly. 
Stop scaring over the edge like that. You're scaring me. You know I don't like heights. Then go away. Why'd you come up here anyway? Well, if you must know, your parents asked, to, um, asked me to come see what you were doing. Of course they did. Wouldn't want fragile little Rye to hurt himself. Right, get away, get away from there. Right, right, please. Orange light swirled around him, wrapping him in a shell of magic. He shot upwards, the magic booing him up and taking him high into the trees. He crashed through the branches, finally breaking through the tree line and above the forest. He soared into the sky, the magic propelling him like a rocket. He spun in the air, delighted. Rai opened his eyes, looking around. The moon was full tonight, bathing the world in its pale light. In every direction he looked, he could see only the antlerwood. It hadn't seemed nearly this large on the map. Why, a pony could live his entire life in this forest and never fully explore it. An interesting notion. He did a somersault in midair, laughing. He flapped his wings, hovering in the air high above the forest. They weren't really holding him up. He was keeping himself lifted with magical um, levitation, but it had been so long since he spread them that he wanted to maintain the illusion. He swooped down towards the trees as fast as he could go. He skimmed the tops of the branches, letting his hoof drag through them. Then he soared up into the sky, feeling the wind rush over his face. It was amazing. He could do anything he wanted. Let's Fritz and the others stare at him now. That, um, they'd get what they deserve. Rai flew up and up, finally piercing the clouds. Around him was a sea of white, broken here and there by holes um, in the fluffy mist. <sighs> he landed gently on the cloud, standing on it with all four hooves. He didn't fall through the wispy material, instead bouncing lightly on, in the whiteness. One of the perks of having a pegasus for a mother. He trotted to the edge, looking down over the silent forest. He looked up at the moon again and ignited his horn. The brilliant orange light was blinding. Rai felt the magic rushing through him, and now he completely opened himself to it. It was an intense, fiery, fiery blast of ecstasy. I almost feel like it must be like on drugs or something. This must be what the gods feel like. Here he could tap into his full potential, throw away the stigma that had followed him his entire life. Here he was no longer the little crippled pe um, pegacorn. He was like Celestia now, the greatest strength of unicorns and pegsai combined into one perfect being, an alicorn, perfection, bliss. Except, except soon they would be leaving the forest behind, along with its life-giving magic. Rai paused, letting his horn's light fade. He paced the cloud, deep in thought. Their mission was too important. They had to get to Sleetnor to bring reinforcements to fight the Griffins. All of Equestria's ponies were counting on them, whether they knew it or not. And what have they ever done for me? He wondered. No, no! He couldn't think like that! The princess had given him a task, and he had, um, and he had sworn to complete it. He would get the trees to the nether, um, northern thanes. But, did he have to deliver them? Inker had made it plain that he would prefer to go alone from the start. Perhaps Rai should um, let him take Cranberry and allow them to go to sleep north themselves. They wouldn't need his help, anyway. Cranberry might be disappointed, but she could never understand what this place was, what allowed him to be. Rai reached his head into the cloud, taking a bite. The fluffy material dissolved in his mouth, melting into water and drizzling down his throat. Oh wow, it's kind of like eating snow, it sounds like. He sighed in contentment. There was plenty of edible plants below, and the clouds could keep him hydrated. He could stay here as long as he wanted to. A tiny voice in the back of his head whispered to him, This isn't right, and you know it. But this was the chance of a lifetime. He could fly. He could finally experience the same joy his mother had told him about all his life. Feel the same breath of air his father spoke of when he discussed magic. Live the life he wanted, the life he deserved. You can't fly. Nonsense. Here he was, standing on top of a cloud in the middle of the sky. It's just the magic. It's not even you, really. Well, the forest may be responsible, but he was still the one using the magic, wasn't he? He had every right to enjoy himself. It feels good, doesn't it? It did. It really did. 
Was this how his mother felt every day she left the ground? It's almost... seductive. The subconscious choice of words was unsettling. Rai shook his head. Whatever his doubts, he knew that he couldn't let this opportunity slip by. No, his mind was set. His future, whatever it was, lay in this forest. He stepped back, got a running start, and dived off the cloud. He swooped down, zooming over the trees. He circled around, finally finding the place he'd taken off from. It looked the same as every other patch of forest, but all he had to do was to cast a memory spell. His father had tried to teach that one um, to him more times than he cared to think about to find the positions of the clouds that told him where the others slept. He descended back into the trees, landing on the ground with a thud. Rai walked back toward the road, bouncing with excitement, and began preparing. Look, I think I'm slowing you two down, and it's not fair that you have to carry all my weight around to sleep, Nord. No, no, too passive. We're not moving fast enough. The griffins could attack at any moment. Inger, I think you should take the trees and go on ahead. He finally reached the road, lighting the way with a swarm. He kept the... He kept the light toned down, not wanting to wake his companions up. He found the spot where they had been sleeping and looked around for them. There was no sign of either Inger or Cranberry. Maybe he had the wrong place. No, there were his saddlebags containing the precious treaties. He fit them on and wrapped his cloak around his back. Cranberry? He called softly. Inger? Hello? There was no answer. They must have gone on without me. Rai was delighted for a moment, thinking that perhaps they had decided to leave him on their, um, behind on their own. Good, he wouldn't have to say goodbye. But reality sank in, and he frowned. Cranberry, at least, wouldn't go without a farewell, and Inger wouldn't leave the trees behind. Hello? Is any pony there? He heard a faint chittering sound in response. Rai froze. They hadn't encountered a single other creature in this forest. What was making that noise? It was no pony, that's for sure. He blinked out his light, creeping closer to the noise. It continued, uh, and he followed it down the road. It was coming from the south, the way they'd come down the path. He didn't have to travel very far before he found what was making the sound, along with Cranberry and Inger. In the pitch blackness, he could barely make out the shapes of the two ponies lying completely still on the ground. Around them swarmed a group of... things. They were huge, shelled creatures, with long car um, carapaces that glinted dimly in the faint moonlight that shone through the trees. They were insect-like, but Rai had never heard of a two-meter-long centipede. They had waving antenna, and they were dripping with some kind of ooze, clacking their short, stubby mandibles together. They had dozens of legs, maybe even a hundred, and they were crawling all over Inger and Cranberry. Rai was transfixed, staring in horror at the monstrosities. He realized that the ecor dripping from their shells was covering the two ponies. The insect things were slathering them with it and molding it with their forelegs. Already, Cranberry was half encased in the stuff. It seemed to solidify as he watched, folding around them and solidifying into a hard shell. Rai realized he had to do something. He stepped toward the creatures and, be and began to picture a flame. He choked. The last time he'd done this, he'd nearly blown all of them to bits. He couldn't risk killing the ponies. But no. Rai grinned. He had more control now. In this forest, he was whole. A great tongue of flame burst forth from his horn, sweeping over the insect things. They chittered in panic, falling backwards away from the ponies. Rai advanced, studying the fire chasing after them. They fled, one being caught in the fire and squirming as it roasted it in its shell. Rai chased them, sending more flames to burn the creatures. He laughed, glorying in the release of the magic. Behind him, he heard more of the chittering. He turned around to find dozens more of the creatures swarming over the ponies. He raced toward them, his horn glowing, the orange light reflecting off their shells. The creatures grabbed the ponies in their jaws and began dragging the still half cocoon cranberry and Inger away. Even carrying the weight of two full grown ponies, the insect things were fast. Inger galloped as hard as he could, trying to keep, um, keep them in sight. He sent bursts of fire after them, missing and igniting some of the trees. As he raced past, he found the trees in the magic and snuffed at the fire with a thought. 
The insect things dragged the ponies over roots and rocks, through bushes and streams, past endless trees and deep in the night. Rai followed. Gradually, he realized that they were moving northwest, traveling along the length of the forest. It was all he could do to keep the um, insect things in sight, desperately trying to catch up. The ponies were moving. He hoped they were still alive. The road was long gone, vanished somewhere behind them. He began closing the distance, shooting another fireball at the creatures. He hit one of them, frying it instantly, but another one grabbed the pony from it and continued its wild flight. Rai drew nearer, feeling that the chase was about to come to an end. The insect, cre um, the insect things crawled over a large rock, down the other side, and vanished. Rai slowed to a stop. He channeled, he channeled magic through his horn, illuminating the area. He soon discovered what had happened. A long crevice stretched out in the ground, a great hole in the earth that vanished into the darkness below. The light from his horn showed that all the walls in the hole began to curve away, leading into the depths. The insect things had disappeared into the hole along with his companions. Stepping away from the hole, Rai paced frantically. He had to do something. But what could he do? They were gone. They were gone. Who knew where this tunnel led? If he pursued them into that hole, he could end up lost forever underground. It would mean leaving behind the forest. Rai was paralyzed with indecision. There was almost no chance he could save them now. He still had the trees. He could still complete his task. Or he could remain in the forest, living freely and basking in the magic. Flying. He would stay in the trees, filled with magic and energy. He could do anything, cast any spell to keep himself amused, research the strange power of the forest. He would grow old, alone in the forest, but freed from the pitying stares of the open revulsion of other ponies. Rai reached into the magic again. It was sweet, sweeter than life itself. He craved more of it. His body cried out in the need of that touch, that fire. Always remember, Rai, your friends are your greatest strength. Celestia's voice echoed back to him. Rai moaned in agonizing uncertainty. But I have everything. I can be anything. I have everything I've ever wanted. But can you sacrifice your friends to do so? I... He began, struggling to fight off tears. I... Ask yourself, Rai. Can you live with this choice? Can you live with yourself? Rai choked, shivering. He saw Cranberry's face, full of laughter, trying to tell him everything she knew about the Nord Ponies. He saw Inger, cold and distant as always, but loyal beyond a doubt to the princess and her subjects. He saw himself, old and filled with power, mass of the forest, the king of Antlerwood. His magical prowess unmatched and unchallenged. Magic, flight, fulfillment, destiny. I'm never going to fly, Cranberry. Never going to do magic. Never going to get past his broken little body. Never going to live. Well, as some pony is never going to fly or do magic, let me tell you, it's not that bad. You don't understand- I understand plenty, Rai Strittle. I know it hurts. I know it's unfair. I know sometimes you feel you can't keep going on anymore. But you're not alone. I'm your friend, Rai, and I won't abandon you. Now come on. Let's get back down to the bakery. Cranberry? Yes? Thank you. I won't leave you behind either. Bracing himself, he reached deep into the magical maelstrom and broke the contact. It was like diving into ice water. He felt a second cold from his horn. It was like it had been snapped off, broken away and torn from his body. He gasped with the shock of it. It didn't hurt, not physically, but the pain in his soul was unbearable. Tears flowed freely down his face and he fell to the ground. He shuddered, racked with sobs. It was gone gone again, and with it his heart's desire. Now he was alone, back in his ruined body, bereft of magic and flight, left on his own devices once again. The feeling of wholeness, the sense of fulfilled potential, was gone like a puff of smoke. He shook feverishly. The last tremors faded. He stood, shaking, still feeling like he'd lost a limb, but he didn't have time to deal with the tremendous loss. His friends were down there, and they needed him. Rai gulped, wiping his hoof across his eyes to dry them. 
Gotta keep it together, I. He looked deep into the abyss, then back up to stare at the forest surrounding him. The trees seemed to whisper to him. Come back. Come back to us. Be who we were meant to be. Rai's face stiffened with determination. I am. He jumped into the hole. Ooh, that was good. A little internal struggle there. <sighs> Chapter 16 Windstreak flew through the air, high above the river. Her fire wings in the Cloudsdale Pegasi under her charge were busy at work, filling the skies. She had ordered them to gather as many clouds as they could. They were creating rainstorms and sending them south to disrupt the Griffin's troop movements. It was a large effort for a small payoff, but the ponies needed every advantage they could get in the coming battle. Though Wisterman had finally arrived the day before, the Griffins still vastly outnumbered them. The Griffins had been sending raid groups to harass the defenders. On their first attack, they had tried to fly around the ponies and take them from behind. They hadn't expected the fire wings. The attack was, um, was quickly repulsed and many of the Griffins were killed in the subsequent fight, but they had been sending more and more, wearing away at the stamina of the Pegasi and whittling their numbers down. Every pony they lost was irreplaceable, but for every griffin they killed, there were three to take its place. With the addition of Westerman's troops, Celerity's army had reached nearly 4,400 fighting ponies. 4,400, not much. All prepared to defend the bridge at the cost of their lives. The Duchess had been everywhere, walking among her soldiers to boost their morale and to make sure her troops were ready for the coming battle. Wistrick was impressed, despite herself. The Unicorn loved her people dearly and would fight to defend them. Windstreak hovered, looking north. In the distance, Whitetail Forest blanketed the horizon, and somewhere beyond that lay Canterlot. Apricot would be opening the store in an hour, flipping over the sign and letting in the customers. She could almost smell the bread baking in the ovens, and hear her husband's fussing as he prepared each page tree for, for sale. She missed him terribly. And then there was Rye sent far to the north on a dangerous quest at the, be um, at the behalf of the princess. Windstreak had been furious, and then terrified, when Celestia told her about Rai's encounter with the griffins in the forest. I knew I shouldn't have let him wander in there. Don't blame yourself, ma'am. Her lieutenant had flown up behind her without making a noise. Bertrand! I thought I told you not to do that. Sorry, ma'am. He didn't look very sorry, giving her a cheeky grin. It faded, and he said, But I am serious, Captain. Don't dwell on it. He'll be fine. Winstreet had told no one else about her son's mission. All the rest of the Fire Wings simply knew that Celestia had sent messengers to the north to ask for aid. They didn't know that it was their Captain's only son. She had kept her personal life very pi private from the rest of the Fire Wings. Most of the longer-serving members had met her husband, Apricot, but very few of them knew her son personally. Even the princess hadn't seen him since he was a tiny fowl, only a few months old. No wonder she hadn't recognized him when they met. She'd intentionally said little about him, except to her closest brothers and sisters in arms. Pegacorns were shunned, considered mutants and aberrations, and she wanted to spare Rye as much of that as possible. Perhaps too much. Had she and Apricot smothered him, prevented him from living in a vain attempt to perfect um to protect him from the pain of a world that had never understood his kind? Maybe that's why he'd galloped off on this crazy um, journey of Sleepnord. Oh, Rye, I'm so sorry. I never wanted this for you. Eight years ago, she, Bergen, and another firewing named Inger had defended the town of Trottingham from an attack by the mountain's trolls. During that desperate fight, Winstreet had met a young baker pony, Apricot Strudel. He'd been scared, as they all had been, but he'd offered up his bakery as a safe house for the town's ponies. In the last night of the attack, as, they'd, um, as they had all waited to die, Winstrick and Apricot had talked to each other to take their thoughts away from the impending doom. He'd been quiet and calm, with kindness in his soul that struck a deep resonance within her. They survived the night, thanks to the efforts of Bertrand and the rest of the wings, and Winstreet offered to stay behind for a while to help rebuild the town. The marshal had agreed, and so for three months, Winstreet found herself living outside the military for the first time in her life. She and Apricot hadn't fallen in love instantly. It had taken at least a day. Together, they helped Trottingham get back on its hooves, and after three months, the town was as good as new. 
On the last night of her leave, she and Apricot, um, Apricot sat down under the stars, looking up at them together. She'd struggled to say goodbye, trying desperately to find the right words. But when she opened her mouth, what spilled out instead was, Will you marry me? Apricot had laughed and kissed her. Their wedding was held two months later in the capital of Canterlot. The princess herself had presided, clearly delighted um, for her personal guard pony. Winstreet had continued to serve in the fire wings, and Apricot moved to the capital to own his own, open his own bakery. She lived there with him, completely satisfied. The day she discovered she was pregnant with Rye had been the happiest of her life. The months had passed like seconds, and before she had even become accustomed to the idea of motherhood, she and Apricot were parents of a tiny, newborn colt. But what should have been the most beautiful of all um, was soon darkened by tragedy. The new parents sat and listened quietly as the midwife explained her son's condition. Normally, when a pony was born to a couple of mixed species, the unicorn would result in one of um, the union would result in one or the other, a Pegasus or a unicorn, or more commonly an Earth pony. But their son, through some genetic fluke, had both wings and a horn. He was a Pegacorn one of the rarest breed of pony and one of the most reviled. They were sickly, undersized fowls and rarely made it to adulthood. If, against the odds, they survived, pegacorns were the embodiment of every insecurity and jealousy a pony could have. The nurse pony held little hope that Rye would live through the year. Apricot had held her as she cried for her son, devastated by the realization that everything had changed. They swore to each other that they would do everything they could to help their little rye, knowing that their lives would never be the same. As the little fowl had struggled to take its first steps, Winstreet cooed encouragements. Come on, rye, you can do it. The little colt had walked unsteadily across the room, supported by his parents. He flopped his tiny wings and Winstreet had kissed his horn. Tears of joy and sorrow ran down her face, and she told the little fowl, I'll always be here for you, rye. Always. I promise. But now he was gone, and she was hundreds of miles away, unable to see him, see him, unable to be there for him. She blinked, her eyes watery. Bergeron had hovered beside her, unwilling to disturb her reflection. He looked over his shoulders to the south and breathed sharply. Captain Winstreak. Her reverie broken, Winstreak went around. What? To the south. Look. He pointed at her. The horizon, bare just minutes before, was rapidly filling with a black line. At the Firewings watched, the line grew and grew until it covered the edge of the land as far east and west as the naked eye could see. The Griffins had finally arrived. <sighs> Winstreet's face hardened. Signal the alert. Get the Cloudsdale Pegasi ready to defend the airspace. I'll make sure that the line at the bridge is ready. They snapped salutes at each other and flew off, beating her wi their wings furiously. She lay in front of Celerity's tent, bursting aside. Duchess, the Griffins are here. We need to prepare the bridge. The Duchess was in the process of putting on her armor. Already she was covered in mail, shiny and polished to perfection. She did not turn around. Have the Westerman ponies take the line. I want two shield ponies in front of every spear. Her horn glowed at the last piece of armor, the helmet lifted into the air. Are the Air Forces ready? Yes, we'll keep the skies clear. Excellent. The helmet descended slowly over Celerity's head, her horn fitting snugly through a um, hole cut in the helmet's forehead. She turned her head to look at Winstreak with one eye. Today, we'll give them a fight they will never forget. The bridge um, was filled from side to side. The long line of ponies stirred, stood firm, their shields and spears ready to defend it. The front line had their shields mounted on their sides, crouched sideways to present them to the enemy. Behind them, the spear ponies had their weapons gripped firmly in their teeth. Without opposable claws like the dragons or the griffins, the ponies had been forced to, um, to be interventive with, um, about their weaponry. Beyond the spear ponies were the main fighters of the army, armed with um, the old standby weapon of Equestria, the hoof mace. It was as simple as it was deadly, a heavy weight worn like a horseshoe, firmly secured and molded around their hooves. It was flattened on the bottom with a sharp edge to bring a maximum crushing power down on anything unlucky enough to be in its way. The unicorns wore no weapons and had li very little armor. Their greatest asset was their magic, 
and a few well-placed spells could turn the tide of a battle. The biggest I had to stay light and so wore no armor, except for the Firewings whose gold-laced railmen gleamed in the sun. They would fight tooth and hoof against the griffins in the sky, turning the weather against their foes and making sure the griffins could not surround the ponies on the ground. But the griffins were many and the ponies few. General Shrikefeather took to the air with his lieutenant, staring out over the battlefield. It's a good plan. Whoever leads them is no fool. He flicked his tail. We'll take it nonetheless. Sir, we could clear that line with our siege weaponry. We wouldn't have to risk any of our troops. We cannot risk damaging the bridge. We'll test their strength at the line. Tell the infantry to advance. His eyes narrowed in anticipation. It looks like we'll have a proper fight after all. <clears throat> the vast horde of griffins reached the river at noon. At some, unseen, at some unseen signal, they raised their weapons. They began banging their swords and spears, against, and spears against their shields. Roaring and beating out a marching rhythm, the griffins set up a war chant across the river, a, a cacophony of noise and bloodlust that sent chills into the hearts of the ponies. Duchess Bell, riding between the line of the br um, bridge and those arrayed along the shore, shouted over the din. Remain steadfast, soldiers of Whitetail. Fear no enemy. Hold your ground. The ponies stood firm. The first attack came from the air. The griffins lifted off, soaring through the air like harpies after blood, filling the skies with feathers and steel. The firewings and Cloudsdale Pegasi flew to meet them. The two great forces clashed in the sky in a whirlwind of combat that readily, rapidly degenerated into an airborne brawl. Windstreak smashed her hoof mate, um, her hose into the face of a griffin, crushing its beak and sending it flying backwards. The griffin fell from the sky, down toward the river below. The griffins fought like mad ponies, breaking through the griffin's defenses and killing dozens by themselves. The Cloudsdale ponies darted through the sky, disturbing the air currents and disrupting the griffin's flying ability. Where there might be a rush of hot air to lift a griffin, suddenly there was a cold wind from the back blast of a Pegasus flight to send them plummeting downward. The griffins in turn fought fiercely, breaking their battle, battle claws into the ponies. The unarmored Cloudsdale ponies did their best, but against the weapons of the griffin they were nearly defenseless. The battle raged on, and blood rained down from the sky with the corpses of the fallen. Wow, that actually sounds pretty awesome. If someone can make like an animation of this, that would be totally awesome. Do it, please. Below, the bridge had turned into a killing ground. The griffins surged into the structure, crushing against the line of the Westerman ponies. The griffins were testing the line for strength, sending in their poorly armored spear fodder first. The griffins smashed into the line of shield ponies, who instantly stalled their advance. Behind them, the ponies sh um, shoved their spears into the gap, ravaging the, po um, the griffin shock troops. The griffin war cry was replaced by screams and hoarse cries as they fell, pierced by the spears of the equestrians. The, um, the bridge was raised in the middle, allowing the blood to flow down either side. Soon the stones were, stones were slick with the gore of the dying griffins. The avians pulled back, their first, um, their first push thwarted. Above, the aerial battle had reached a fever pitch. Windstreak was in the thick of it, flying into combat with any griffin she saw. Though the griffins were many, the firewings were more than a match for any of them in single combat. The day dragged on, and more and more of the griffins fell to their hooves. The battle lasted for over three hours. No pony could fight that long without becoming utterly exhausted, but Celerity replaced the ponies at the bridge line with fresh troops every 20 minutes. The griffins tried again and again to breach their line, but those that tried to push through their shields were crushed, and those who tried to fly over them were pierced on the sharp spear points of the ponies in the middle of the line. The griffins pulled back near 3 o'clock to lick their wounds and plan the next assault. In the sky, the air raiders broke away from the fight, retreating south over the river. Windstreak ordered her troops to let them go. They couldn't risk pursuing um, them over the griffin army. The Pegasi descended to the ground to rest their aching wings and recover from the fierce battle. Windstreak sought out on Duchess Bell, finding her at last at the rear of the bridge, overseeing the latest change in line. Duchess! Windstreak landed heavily in front of her, letting her wings hang limply at her sides. Her one shiny arm was now grimy, splattered with blood and sweat. A griffin had gone in a lucky hit, scoring a slash across her breastplate. There was a jagged gash through the symbol of the sun. 
Their aerial force had pulled back. The skies are clear, for the moment. Excellent work, Captain. Duchess Bell looked tired, but pleased. We've held the bridge in the skies against their assaults. It will be some time before they try again. Are you wounded? And Streak shook her head. Not seriously. Then get some rest. You'll need it for tomorrow. The Duchess turned away. Leroy, I want those reinforcements brought up to the front of the line. Get to it. The Firewing Captain walked away, giving her wings a rest. From above, Bergeron appeared, landing beside her. Captain, I think the sisters are all right. They smiled at each other, relieved to see that they were both unharmed. Report, Bergeron. How many did we lose? Miraculously few, considering. Perhaps three score from Cloudsdale have fallen, and... I'm sorry, Captain. Miles was killed. He flew down to save a Pegasus in distress and got hit from behind by one of the raiders. Winstreet accepted the news quietly. But no others? All the rest of the Firewings are still fit for fighting, ma'am. Ingrid has a mild concussion from getting banged on the helmet, but no others have reported serious injuries. Let us hope that tomorrow's battle goes well. I'll see you in the morning, then. We're running search and rescue for any Pegasi that fell during the battle. Some of them may have survived. Thank you, Bertrand. Good luck. To you as well, Captain. He saluted and flew off. Winstreet um, walked in the direction of the Firewing's tents, determined to get some sleep before the fighting resumed. General Shrikefeather listened with displeasure to the after-action report. It seemed they were better prepared than our scouts suggested. Sir, it's those Pegasi in the golden armor. There are only a few hundred of them, but they fight like Krishnika. Yeah, they're not demons, Lieutenant. Just very good soldiers. Celestia's the elite guard, if I'm not mistaken. He scowled. I rarely am. He flicked his talons idly, thinking. We need to control the air if we're going to if we're um, to take the bridge on schedule. I want every attack squadron we have marshaled by tonight. We'll attack at dawn. Send Captain Withers to me. I'll need to brief him personally. Are the Maulers prepared? They just rel um, they just arrived on the field this morning, sir. They'll be fit for combat tomorrow. Good. If Withers does his job right, we'll have the opening we need. They were swapping out the line every 20 minutes. If they keep that pattern tomorrow, we'll exploit it. Once they break that line, the ponies will be forced to retreat. We'll chase them into the Northlands and crush them. He snapped his claws shut. Very good, sir. Before you go, Lieutenant, tell me, have the scouts learned who leads the army? He hadn't seen Celestia on the field today, which meant she was um, likely far away in the capital. That was for the best. He wasn't looking forward to fighting the God Queen. Not yet. Not so early in his campaign. campaign. A unicorn. The Duchess Celerity Bell. Celerity? Of course. I should have expected as much. He tapped a talent on the ground. She's been a thorn in my side for the last 20 years. It's thanks to her that our rays were never able to take Cell Paloth. I'll look forward to killing her. Personally. Give the orders that she is to be left to me. I want to see the look on her face when we march into the plains over the bodies of her troops. And yeah, that is it. So in this one, I now that Krishnika is supposed to be demons. So, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it has some history of some sort. I'll check that out. Maybe just use it for the heck of it. Anyway, so as it's late for me, I will be going to bed now and hope to see you all at some over some other time. Good night everybody.